last time. So I mentioned it last time. This is related to graph expansion and eigenvalues of Laplacian. So let me just uh, recall what I said at the very end of last lecture. So what we have already seen is if you have a graph, remember that for me, graph is always a finite graph without loops and uh, uh, multiple edges, etc. So it's a finite uh, simple graph. First eigenvalue is zero. Second eigenvalue is zero if and only if the graph is disconnected. Okay, so whenever the graph is connected, lambda two is positive. What we want is a quantitative version of this. Okay, so we want to uh, have this uh, idea that uh, we have to define quantitatively connectedness. Okay, so as I said, sometimes uh, there are uh, naturally occurring graphs where the connection is weak. As I said, social networks. So for some reason, so for example, if you take uh, students in a school, uh, and uh, make the graph between every, you put an edge between every pair of students who are friends, then you see that uh, often within class, uh, there are lots of, lots of edges, but across class, there may be fewer edges. It's not that they don't exist. They, they do exist. So if you have two classes, it, within class, there will be a lot of friends, but uh, across class, maybe less, a bit less. So it will, the picture will look a bit like here, so there is one group well connected, another group well connected, and the two groups are kind of sparsely connected. So sometimes it's important to be able to detect this. For example, if you want to, I mean, so this is uh, important in many situations. So you have uh, two kinds of, uh, so you want to separate people according to some grouping, okay? So, uh, so for example, if this data was given to you, can, could you kind of find out who? So suppose I give you the graph, connecting. So there is a school with exactly two classes, let us say. And I give you the friendship graph between them. From the friendship graph, would you be able to separate the two classes? Okay, so can, can you tell this, these people belong to one class, these people belong to another class? Of course, errors are allowed, but uh, you should largely get it correct. Now the idea is, if it was the case that nobody uh, in one class would be friends with nobody in another class, then it's easy. You take the two clusters of the graph and that would give you. But when there is weak connection, there are no two clusters. There is a single connected graph. How do you do that? One of the ideas is this is called a clustering. I mean, this is a very important problem in theoretical CS. Uh, it is uh, algorithmically also important to be able to do it properly. One of the things is uh, suggested is that, yes, we can do it using the second eigenvector of the uh, graph, okay? If uh, there's time at the end, I'll just uh, roughly mention what I mean by that. Uh, but okay, approximately here is what it is. You look at the second eigenvector, okay, F2. This is the eigenvector, so it's a function on the vertices. You look at all the vertices where it is positive, you put that as one cluster, you look at all the vertices where it is negative and put them as another cluster. And this is the this is a kind of a good solution to this uh, separating two classes, okay? So assuming there are two classes, this is a good way to separate them that you just look at the, from the, you are given the graph in some way. You are given the 150 people, you are given all the edges on the computer, you can just calculate the second eigenvector look at all those vertices where F2 is positive, put them as one cluster, all those where it is negative, put them as another cluster, and that gives you the separation of the two clusters. So that's an amazing algorithm. How uh, the Laplacian and its eigenvector have anything to do with this kind of graph structure? So it is kind of justified by what we are going to do now, which is just a quantitative version of this thing. So we have seen this, lambda two is zero, if and only if G is disconnected. What we want to do is a more uh, quantitative version of this where we allow weak connection. So we have to define weak connection, weakly connectedness. And we all also have to say what that has to do with- This meeting is being recorded. Being recorded. Any questions? Is there a question? Okay. So, let me go on. First, let me define this uh, quantity which denotes graph uh, connectedness, okay? So quantitative way to measure connectedness is by something called graph expansion. So 
So it is a quantitative measure of connectedness. Okay, how, how is it, how do we define? So somehow the idea is this. So if we have a graph like this, so to draw a picture similar to uh, this, suppose I have a graph which is, uh, there are lots of edges, this is well connected. Because if I imagine that but these two are somewhat uh, sparsely connected. So this is weakly connected. So we want something that can measure such things. Okay, so that's what we are going to define. Okay, so how do we define? So let me define a quantity. It is not immediately clear how it is uh, uh, measuring, I'll explain. So let G, be our graph V comma E. Okay, I don't know if I use script G or capital G, whatever. This is the graph. This is our finite graph. So we define the expansion coefficient H sub G. It is defined for the graph, okay? Well, by G, I mean this. Let's just call it G. H sub G is the following you take any subset, okay? You take any subset of vertices with cardinality less than equal to n by two. Okay, so I will always assume V is just one to n. N is the number of vertices. So you take any set subset of vertices with at most half of the vertices, okay? And then you see how many edges are there going from S to S complement, okay? And measure the size. So this is the numerator is the number of edges UV with one end in S and other end in S complement. Okay, so that is what uh, you count. So that is somehow how well S is connected to its complement. Okay, so when there is, if it was disconnected and you take S to be one of the components, this number will be zero. Now you divide it by the number of size of S. This is the number of elements of S. Cardinality of S. So this is how well S is connect. This is a measure of how well S is connected to its outside, okay? Why do we divide by the volume of S? So if you take S to be a single vertex, you expect, okay, this will be the degree of the vertex, right? How many, if you take S to be a single ton vertex, then how many edges are coming out of it to the complement? It is the degree of the vertex and you would divide by one. But if you have a large set, you should expect correspondingly more edges going out. So we look at the number of edges going out of S, but in proportion to the number of vertices inside S. And we take the worst case in the sense of minimum over all S with cardinality S less than equal to N by two. And this is called the graph expansion or uh, there are many names for it. Let's just call it the graph expansion constant, okay? So this is how it is uh, defined. Does it, uh, I mean, is the definition clear? Is there anything? Unclear about the definition. Uh, can you repeat H sub G again, sir, please? Huh. So to calculate H sub G, you calculate for each, I have to go over all possible subsets of V, okay? But not all possible subsets, all possible subsets with size less than N by two, less than equal to N by two. I take all such subsets and see how many edges go outside that and divide by the size of the subset. And I take the minimum over all subsets, okay? That is what I call H sub G, okay? So let right. me calculate it for, let's do it for a couple of examples, okay? So then it may be clear. 
example first let us take g to be the complete ga in this case if s if cardinality s is k then what is the size of how many edges go from s to s complement so remember the complete graph means every pair of vertices is connected by an edge like this this is k4 so if cardinality of s is k some number k into n minus k exactly it is k into n minus k because every vertex here is connected to every vertex here one edge so k the k vertices here n minus k here and every pair is connected by an edge so it's exactly this so what will be then hg then hg will be i have to take minimum i am not allowing k to go over n by 2 okay so i have to take it doesn't matter which subset i take so instead of taking all, all subsets it's minimum over all only k less than equal to n by 2 of k times n minus k divided by k do you agree k is the size of s this is so if i take the ratio i get n minus k and i have to take minimum over this and what is this number this is well it is exactly n by 2 okay if any one otherwise it is n by 2 plus minus 1 i mean you have to take the nearest integer that's all but let's not worry about that it makes a difference of one half only so this is n by 2 so this is a this is the expansion so would you say complete graph is well connected or not well connected what would you say don't don't think of h just in by common sense what would you say is it huh? well connected it's well connected it's as well connected as possible right everyone is friends with everyone right so it's as well connected as possible and you see this is n by 2 now let us see some other graph let us say g is this graph so let's say 1 to dot 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 up to n again i take a graph with n vertices and this is the graph i i hope it is clear what it means one is connected to two two is connected to one and three and so on okay so in this graph let us calculate so what is the minimum so what is the possible minimum in this case what would you take s to be so that to minimize so if s is let us say 1 to k okay uh, let me yeah so for example if s is 1 to k then what is e of s s complement so if i take these vertices up to k then how many it just go out of s into s complement one yes only one right and so what does e of s is complement by or uh, if i do this divided by cardinality of s what do i get i get 1 divided by k so if i take the minimum over all possible k less than equal to certainly these are candidates right so this implies that h is less than or equal to 1 over k for all k less than or equal to n by 2 agree because you can take any such set which has less than n by 2 elements each of them is giving an upper bound for h so any of those the minimum of those numbers is more than h i am not considering all subsets here at the moment i am only considering some specific subsets so that will give me i can't say this is equal so implies so what is the best that comes out of this this tells me that hg is less than equal to how much what would you take k to be to minimize this as large as possible right so you take it to be the largest possible which is m by 2 so it is something like 2 over n so you see h is only very tiny number with large n for when n is large this is a tiny number compared to complete graph where h is also very large 
so this is very weakly connected so this is well connected so y is then equal to 10 by 2 sorry why are we taking k less than equal to n by 2 here because i cannot take k more than n? i have to take only subsets of size less than equal to n by 2 are you asking why it's so in the definition or why it is so in this example see the, the definition ha ah, okay so it's a good question why we should we take over less than equal to n by 2 see if we don't take ha ah, that's a good question let me come to that but before that are these two examples clear they indicate how small this is so as another example work out the following case can you please repeat the definition of well connected and weakly connected like how are you categorizing them no 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 the the thing is we so this is actually the most non trivial part in mathematics what is a good definition okay so nobody tells us so definitely in uh, when you are studying in uh, undergraduate or masters you we read from textbooks we take definitions for granted but there's those definitions came from somewhere right so the point here is what we are trying to say is that one has to come up with a good definition of well connected and uh, or not well connected we don't know so the proposal is h is this the proposal is to use h as a measure of well connectedness but how do we know it is a good definition or a bad definition we check is a reasonableness in cases where we know what we should expect for example we know that complete graph is well connected now why is why should i think this is not well connected because if i just cut one edge it will become disconnected so that's another way to think about it right i mean it's easy to disconnect g by just cutting one edge whereas this is very hard to if you have to disconnect the complete graph you have to cut many edges that is what makes a difference so we are kind of intuitively clear that this should be well connected this should be weakly connected and correspondingly we calculate h and this is large and this is small so it appears that h may be a reasonable measure of connectedness even in cases where we cannot calculate it so we will take that as an acceptable definition is that uh, sort of clear so hello yes sir is it uh, also because you know uh, s if i have uh, one element then s complement has all the remaining Oh, you are you are asking about why s less than equal to n by two. I will come to that. Yeah, okay. you, what you said is exactly right. I will come to that. Let me do. Let me leave one more example. Think of a square root n by square root n grid and show that. Hello. Yes. Yes. uh i mean when see any time you want to speak please unmute but other at other times please keep yourself muted because it causes lot of disturbance and yes, people sir. are talking in the back okay so you show that here also h is bounded by a constant Hello, over n yes yes uh, in this definition of weakly connected which you said if we remove a vertex it may become a, a disconnected graph yeah so is that we are comparing with the complete a graph and we are just uh, saying that in complete graph we need to remove more vertices so that it will become disconnected is that in that sense yeah yeah so in a way so that could also have been a measure of connect well connectedness how many edges do i need to cut so that it becomes disconnected right yeah so that so, can also be a good measure of connectedness but this is a much more uh, deeper and better uh, notion somehow so our uh, norm or our uh, classic fixed thing is complete graph fixed complete yes. graph we we should complete graph should be well connected by any measure if you measure if you come up with a definition and that says that complete graph is not well connected then the definition is not a good one okay so we will compare everything with uh, complete graph and we will do the rest not only complete graph you should have in mind a few examples which intuitively we have an idea like this is very well connected this is weakly connected this two we have idea 
trees are again, trees are not well connected, by the way, all trees in, so you can do this similar thing in all trees. Sir, uh, so are we saying that if uh, remove more than n by 2 make it displayed, then it is um, well connected. If it uh, only less than n by 2 uh, vertices we remove, then it becomes disconnected, then it is weakly connected. No, 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 we are not saying that. So I'm just saying that that is so that is that could have been one notion. You can come up with the notion, you can define a quantity associated to a graph which is the smallest number of edges I want to uh, delete so that it becomes disconnected. Okay, that can be a definition. Is it a good definition? I'm not going to go into that. This is a better definition is all I will assert that this is a much better definition. This H is a much better definition. It's not just asking about disconnection. It is measuring how much goes out of S as a proportion of the size of S. Okay, so it is measuring well connectedness of S to S complement and you take the worst case because then you get the idea. So for example, even in this graph, if you take, so you, you have to take that minimum. Okay, now let me explain the definition. Why the minimum and why S less than equal to N by two, even here. So it is an important point to note that even here, if S is, if you take a foolish choice of S, like one, three, five, seven, et cetera, Odd, odd ones. Then how many edges go from S to S complement? So let us say N is 2M and you go up to M minus uh, 2M minus one here, right? All the odd ones. How many edges are going out of S to S complement? All of them, sir. All of them. So it is roughly N, right? So if you divide by that, you will get something like n by n, which is approximately one, okay? It may not be exact calculation. Maybe it is one minus one by n or something. I don't care about that. But you see Number this one, will be n minus. it'll be n minus one. Yeah, I, I, yeah. so n minus one by n, uh, by this is n by two. So this may be uh, two or something like that. Whatever it is, it is way larger than this two over n, you see. This number two here is much larger than this. But it just means that you chose a wrong, wrong subset. What you have to do is you have to choose a good subset which has small expansion. <clears throat> if you choose a bad subset, it will have a large expansion. That I don't care about. The question is whether when you ask whether a graph is disconnected, the question is not whether any subset of vertices will form a connected component. The question is whether you can choose a subset which forms a connected component. So similarly here, it's a question of whether you can choose a subset with such that the expansion is small, not whether every subset has small expansion. That's not going to work. Even, even, in a, even here, there are subsets with large expansion, like two, okay? Okay, so that is why we have to take minimum here. That's the explanation for the minimum. Why mod s less than equal to n by two? Why don't we take other side? Well, one of you said actually already, one of the things is, the number of edges between S and S complement is same as between S complement and S. Okay, so that's not very interesting. Uh, so, but why should I divide? So, so what if I allow everything? So just think here. So if we allow, also sets with cardinality more than N by two, then what should I take S to be? I can take S to be the whole graph or to make it less confusing, let me take S to be one to N minus one. Then what will happen to E of S is complement by cardinality of S in this case. So in the complete graph, if I take S to be one to N minus one, how many edges go out of S? N minus one. It is N minus one. Everything that's connected to N, right? And the cardinality of S is N minus one. So you see, this is one. It is way smaller than N by two. When N is large, this is way smaller than N by two. So this is not, it's not a good idea. So to say that 
it doesn't make sense to take S to be this large a set, then the number of edges going out of it will be anyway small because the S complement is small and you are dividing by S, which is large. So that does not make sense. So what you are doing is you are dividing the graph into two parts, taking how many edges go across and dividing by the smaller of the two parts. That's what you're doing. Okay, so that's the explanation for N by two. Any questions here? It's 10 o'clock. Any questions? Uh, does this kind of answer? See, you may not be entirely satisfied with this definition. It is not something that uh, you have to accept right away that it's a great definition. But uh, sometimes it's uh, not clear. So the way mathematics proceeds is actually different from the way we present in textbooks. In textbooks, you have definition first, then theorem, then proof. Quite often, it is the other way. People struggle hard to come up with good definitions. And only when you have good theorems, then you realize, okay, this is a good definition. Okay, if you don't get good theorems out of it, then you don't have any good definition, maybe. So many people may have come up with many other definitions which didn't turn out that good. This one turned out to be good. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, here you have said what if the yes, cardinality of S is greater than N by 2. Yeah. So, so what, what if, if I take S yes, complement to be the S yes, which I am desired of? Then it is fine because the question is what do you divide by? The thing okay, is okay. when you take yes. S to be larger, if you take S to be very large, let, let's take even more extreme. Take S to be the entire vertex set. How many edges go out of it? Zero. Zero. Wow. And you are dividing by N. So every graph will have zero as the minimum. Okay. okay. Right? In that sense, it's not that's not indicating anything, right? So it's not actually indicating anything about the structure of the graph. So it's not a good way to do it. Sir, in this definition, S should be non-empty, no? Ah, you are right. So we should take S to be non-empty. No. Right. We should take S to be not empty. Uh, so take over non-empty sets of the ratio of this. Okay. Any other questions? So if we take all if we take below uh, in the denominator, uh, we can take a minimum of moist and moist is complement. True. Maybe, maybe it doesn't matter, but you have to make sense of zero by zero. Why? Uh, let's omit the uh, empty set. That's all. Right. Then you don't have to. Excluding, excluding empty. No, no, both will be. I mean, excluding the, empty. No, no, if you allow S to be empty set, this will be zero, this will be zero. You have to make sense of what is zero by zero. Instead of trying to do that, we can omit that. We can just omit empty set. We gain nothing by allowing the empty set. So you can say over S non empty. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's okay. uh, not including empty. Yes. Yeah, just exclude the empty set. That's all. Simple. Okay. Okay, so any other questions? Is the definition at least sort of kind of clear? I mean, it is in a way, so it is. Uh, it has to do with, uh, right. Uh, so it is coming, this is an idea that came first in geometry. Okay, in geometry, the question is boundary to volume ratio. That is what matters. Okay, so what happens in boundary to volume ratio? For example, you see, <clears throat> Uh, I mean, so it is an idea, this idea of uh, taking perimeter in geometry, what people were doing was taking the surface area to volume ratio. That is indicative of uh, some, that is indicative of some geometric properties of an object. Okay. So if you take something like a watermelon, the boundary surface area to volume will be something. But if you take something with holes like a cauliflower, the surface area will be very large and the volume for the same volume. Or if you take uh, some spinach, uh, some leaf, right? So the surface area to volume will be very high. Whereas something like a watermelon will have small surface area to volume ratio. So that is called isoperimetric inequality. So the, there is a very famous uh, question, well known. If I give you a string of thread of fixed length, it is a closed uh, string of thread like this, and you want to capture maximum area, how will you place the string? What will you do? So this is a big rope. 
you can take as much land as you want you enclose by this rope you can enclose the rope you can arrange it in a square shape if you like you can arrange it as a triangle you cannot enlarge the enlo elongate the string okay so but all the land inside is yours so then how in what shape will you take the string circle circle indeed this circle maximizes the give area inside for a given perimeter or equivalently if you give the area it minimizes the perimeter for a fixed area it minimizes perimeter or for a given perimeter it maximizes the area so that is exactly the perimeter to volume ratio that is coming there and this is actually inspired by the same thing so this is this can also be called isoperimetric in constant isoperimetric inequality is this statement that among all shapes uh, the for, of a given area the perimeter is minimized by the circle or you know people explain why soap bubbles in physics class you may have heard soap bubbles are spherical in shape why because of surface tension they try to minimize the surface area but the volume can't be reduced some air is trapped inside and that cannot be reduced so for a given volume you have to minimize the surface area and it assumes the shape of a ball okay that is isoperimetric inequality in three dimension so there the surface area to volume plays the role of perimeter to area this is a very similar idea the edges going out is like the connection is like the perimeter how many edges how connection of s to the outside and the number of cardinality of s is like the volume of s so it is like the isoperimetric constant of the graph that's what it can be called so that's just the geometry motivation behind this uh, definition now it is very much used in discrete mathematics and graph theory and so on okay now let me come to state the main theorem that i wanted to tell that is the chiga buser inequality the main one is chigal the buser is the easier one we will state both they are interesting so what it says is that let g be a finite graph then uh, so let h uh, okay so with h is the isoperimetric constant and lambda 2 is the second eigen value second smallest eigen value of the laplacian hello sir yes sir the way you have defined h sub g yeah how it is related to this weakly connected concept no now we will take that as the definition of connectedness Large H means well connected. Small H means weakly connected. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's how. That is the point. I mean, somehow you have some intuition which will go up to some point, but then you have to quantify that intuition. And on the things you already have intuition for, you check that your definition is reasonable. And on things we don't have intuition for, we will still continue to use this precise definition. So here we should have something as. more h like sometimes we may get uh, if you compare two graphs g1 and g2 yeah g1 may have more h value of h could be more and g2 may have less value so we will just say g1 is well connected than g2 that's how we will say well the uh, number if you if you take the same number of vertices then it is okay yeah the more the edges are usually the better connected it is of course you can have more edges and uh, you can have for example you can have uh, i mean that's not exactly correct because you can have for example this has only n minus 1 edges and it is still connected whereas i can have i can take two copies of k n by 2 here this is disconnected right yes. but it has a lot of edges actually 
So, but by and large, more edges would, I mean, if you add edges to a graph, this will only go up. So think of it this way. If I have a graph and I add a few edges to it, can this decrease? No, because for any S, the volume, the size will not change, but the number of edges may increase or may stay the same. It won't decrease, right? If you have added a few edges to the graph without adding vertices, without adding vertices. So my question is whether we are comparing G1 and G2 or we are comparing G with the complete graph. You can do both. You can do both. So here I'm telling you one comparison. Suppose G is some graph you start with and you add a few extra edges to the same graph without adding vertices. Okay. Yeah. So you get a new graph. Let us call it H. Uh, sorry, let's call it, uh, let's say the original graph is G1, the new graph is G2. I am saying HG1 will be smaller than or equal to HG2. Okay. Right? Because for any subset of vertices, vertices have not changed. So any subset of vertices, this part is the same, but the number of edges can be larger in G2 than in G1. Therefore, it will be, it can only be larger, right? Okay, okay. So in that sense, more edges, adding ed extra edges will make it more connected. Similarly, deleting edges can, will only decrease H. So in many ways, it's reasonable. You think in many other ways, uh, then you see whether it is reasonable. So of course you should, uh, when comparing, it is really one should compare with uh, graphs of same cardinality or something like that, roughly speaking. Okay, how exactly, how exactly to do, interpret the number itself is a tricky point. Okay, should I, but the maximum you can get is something like n by 2 and the smallest you can get is something like 1 by n. Okay. And everywhere, every graph will be between the two. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So then let me tell you. Uh, the sir? Ah, yes. 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 Uh, you said uh, that the graph which is having the more number of edges, suppose their cardinality for the vertex is the same. No, 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 no. I did not say that. I, I very clearly clarified that's not exactly correct. More number of edges will not mean, as I gave this example here, if I take G to be zero, the simple line graph, then it has only n minus one edges, but is connected. Whereas if I take k n by 2, k n by 2, two disconnected copies of the complete graph, this also has n vertices and the number of edges is way larger, right? The number of edges yes. in this is way larger. It is something like n square, constant n square. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, this is disconnected. So just uh, making more edges. But what is true is that if you have a graph and you add more edges to it, it will only yes. become more connected. Yes, yes. That That's what I right. Okay. Right. Sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So let's uh, see what is the connection. So now in the, in what I was saying earlier, so we have now defined this notion of quantitative connectedness. Now we have to see what it has to do with Lambda two. That's the theorem. So we are saying that Lambda two is connected to H in the following way. You can bound it above and below by H, okay? So what is the thing? Lambda two is bounded by two times H and it is greater than or equal to H square over two delta, okay? I have not uh, defined de delta. Delta is the maximum degree. So among all degrees, take the maximum degree. Okay, in a graph, different vertices may have different degrees and you take the maximum degree that is delta. So you have this inequality. So equivalently, if you prefer to write in terms of H. Equivalently, you can write, if you care about H, I can write bounds in terms of lambda two. How? H is greater than or equal to lambda two by two and h is less than equal to square root 2 delta into h, okay? So now you see they are, in a way, lambda 2 and h are comparable. Actually, one side we have h, one side we have h square, or equivalently one side we have lambda 2, one side we have, oh, sorry, what did I do? 
H2, H is bounded by 2 delta lambda 2 here. Here it was lambda 2. So you have bound, okay, let's talk in terms of this. These two are equivalent, right? So let's say this one. So this thing is, by the way, this is called Boozer's inequality and this is Cheeger's inequality. Both of them are geometers. These things were found first in the theory of uh, Riemannian manifolds. In the subject of Riemannian manifolds, there are inequalities like this. Later, it was realized that you can write it also in graphs and uh, it is a useful thing. Okay. So basically, lambda 2 and h are equally good measures of connectedness. That's what this is telling us. Of course, lambda 2 is not proportional to h. One side bound is linear in h, one side bound is quadratic in h. But in a rough sense, lambda 2 and h measure the same thing about the graph, namely the connectedness of the graph. That's the statement. So this is a great thing. So in doing defining h, we were not thinking at all about the matrix Laplacian or anything. We were just thinking of the graph in structural terms, right? Edges, vertices, how many edges, etc. But we see that that quantity is captured essentially by a spectral quantity, namely the second eigenvalue. That's the great thing. So that's a, that's why I this topic graphs and matrices this fits very well in this uh, one. Okay. So this is the statement and to an extent, to the extent possible, I want to give you the proof of this. But uh, let me know if you have any questions before we start on proofs. Okay, any questions or clarifications? Is the statement at least uh, interesting looking? It's not maybe as intuitively appealing as the spanning tree theorem that we had, Kirchhoff's theorem. Suddenly, the Laplacian counted some uh, combinatorial thing. This one takes a little more, uh, it's a little, lies a little deeper. It requires a little more thinking to appreciate uh, uh, that this is a great inequality. These are very, these are useful. That requires experience to see, but that it is uh, very nice. You will, maybe if you, after thinking a while, you will feel that way. Okay, if there are no questions, let us prove these inequalities because that's where linear algebra comes in. So somehow, uh, how, uh, so this whole uh, three weeks is some celebration of linear algebra, right? So you see how they come up in different uh, areas of mathematics and uh, how it's uh, it's great subject, okay? So, so let's see what you have learned in linear algebra class, how they will come handy here, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, et cetera. So the easier of the two inequalities is Boozer's inequality. So let's prove that first. So let's prove Boozer's inequality. So I want to prove lambda two is less than or equal to two H. Okay. So now let me ask you, so how can you get upper bounds for eigenvalue? Exact computation is, okay, you can do it on a computer numerically, but how do you get, what do you know about eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix? Anything, this is a good point for discussion of that. What do you know about eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix? Uh, sir, one uh, very famous result we usually use for bounds, that is interlacing theorem. Interlacing uh, theorem, yes, but for that you need two matrices, right? To get interlacing, you yeah, we take a submatrix, principal submatrix of right. a symmetric so matrix. If you take a submatrix, then you can, yeah, its eigenvalues are interlaced with. That's a very interesting mm -hmm. and important theorem, but it will not be helpful for us here. Okay. Because we have only one matrix, Laplace. Yeah. Yeah, if you could find some other matrix for which you know the eigenvalues and this is a submatrix of that, etc., you can try to do it. But how else will you do it? Yeah, Calculating the matrices. going theorem, you mean? Yeah, that is uh, okay. That gives you some sorts of bounds, yes. But uh, something about symmetric matrices and quadratic forms, you know. How do you get the largest eigenvalue in terms of the quadratic form? 
maximum over norm of x hmm. inner product ax into okay. minimum eigen value what do you know so if let's write it here if a is a symmetric matrix with eigen values let's say lambda 1 less than equal to lambda 2 less than equal to lambda n and eigen vectors let's call it f1 f2 fn then what is lambda 1 how do you do lambda 1 what is the variational formula you minimize yeah minimize av inner product v divided by norm v square over all v not equal to 0 right and the minimizing v will be f1 okay how do you get lambda 2 then maximum no but uh, maximum will give you lambda n the v uh, orthogonal to f1 ah very good so here the argument is argument means the the v which minimizes actually there can be it need not be unique but as, let's for simplicity say it's unique then that one we can take to be f1 so lambda 2 will be you have to minimize over v not equal to 0 but v also orthogonal to the first eigen vector and then you minimize the quadratic form av in a product v over norm v square that will give you lambda 2 and again the argument will give you by argument i mean the one argument which minimizes that so this gives you f2 in general lambda k plus 1 will be minimizing <clears throat> the same ratio of the quadratic form to the norm squared over v not equal to 0 and v orthogonal to f1 up to fk so v should be orthogonal to each of the fi's up to k that will give you and the argument will give you fk plus 1 this is one way of you can start from the top and do max or you can do from the bottom and take min if you do max you will get lambda n then you take orthogonal to fn you will and maximize you will get fn v n lambda n minus 1 and so on or you can go from below both are uh, possible so this is what we are going to use here okay so in our case what is the first eigen vector <coughs> for the l what is the first eigen vector of l sir r min min means arg min means that v which minimizes the so this is lambda 1 is the minimum value so you are you have a minimization problem you are minimizing some function of v the minimum value is lambda 1 the v which minimizes is f1 that's what it means. okay uh, so uh, is there any name for this theorem this is is it is it not called really rich or something like that Oh. I think this is called really rich. There is another very useful one which I don't have time to go into, and I don't want to. But there is a minimax formula, which is there is a minimax formula, which is also very useful. Let me tell you. I don't know if uh, in any of the other lectures you managed to cover this kind of thing. See, the thing here is that you have to know. F one before you can write the minimization for lambda two. You cannot write it without knowing F one because it's over v perpendicular to F one. And when we write lambda k plus one, we have to know F one up to F k. But you can write it in a different way without knowing F one up to F k. That's a very beautiful one. So let me just mention it to you. If you have never seen it, you should read about it. It's a beautiful one. So what you do is you minimize over v not equal to zero. and v perpendicular to let's say u1 u2 uk okay you minimize the quadratic form av v over norm v square 
Now, what is U1, U2, UK? You don't know what is, we don't know the eigenvectors. So what you do is you take any U1, U2, UK, and you take the max over all possible U1, U2, UK. Okay? So this is an interesting uh, uh, way of writing. Here you don't need to know the eigenvectors, previous eigenvectors. So you can minimize, this, uh, this is written as max of min. I should write max min formula maybe, but okay. There's also min max, for min max if you come from the other side. So it's maximizing over u1, u2, uk of minimum over v orthogonal to u1, u2, uk of this ratio. That's another one. So these two are both very useful. Variational character, this can be called variational formulas for eigenvalues. What it means is that uh, eigenvalues, which are defined by eigenvalue equation, are here expressed as solutions to some maximization or minimization problems. That's what variational formula is. Okay. Anyway, let's come back to Bose's inequality and apply. We don't need the min-max formula here, uh, but let's look at this one. So how do I write lambda 2? Let's use this one. So what do I get? It is the minimum over v not equal to 0 and v perpendicular to what? All one vector. Perpendicular to? All one vector. All one vector, because that is the first eigenvector. Right? That's the first eigenvector. Okay, that divided by square root n is the, if you want to normalize, but whether it's orthogonal to the constant vector 1 or constant vector 1 over root n is the same thing. So I can write it like this. Of LV in a product V divided by norm v square. Uh, since I was using f, let me just write f instead of v, okay? It's just that I'm thinking of them as functions on vertices. So f not equal to zero, f perpendicular to the constant, LFF divided by norm f square, okay? Now I want an upper bound, how do I, so if, what is the use of this? How do I get upper bounds for lambda to using this? How is this helpful in getting upper bounds for lambda 2? Yeah? Anyone? Um, some particular f. Yeah, any f you take will give you an upper bound. Any uh, f you take will give you an upper bound. So, For any f perpendicular to 1, f not equal to 0, lambda 2 is less than equal to lf in a product f divided by norm f square. Okay. Now, I want to say that lambda 2 is less than equal to this. So, what shall I do? I want to, if I can find a vector f such that its really quotient here is 2h, then I will be done, right? Okay, and what is H? H itself is the minimum. So let's do it for this. For each S, if I find, so for this, let's do it here. So fix any S. Contained in V with cardinality S less than equal to half of the number of vertices, okay? Now, I want to make a vector. Define F to be, I want to somehow define this vector. The idea is, suppose S is a S and S complement are there. So I will, I will take a vector which is, which takes a value, one value here and another value here. Okay, that's what the kind of vector I'm going to take. But I want to ensure that this is not zero vector and it is perpendicular to one. So how should I take A and B? Any idea? So let's say cardinality S is K, let us. So let's say K is the cardinality of S. How should I define the values on the two things so that F will be orthogonal to the constant vector? 
is on every vertex in s you can take it to be n which is perpendicular to 1 yeah f has to be perpendicular to 1 so question is what values i want to take the same value here and another same value here there must yeah there is some positive space so we can just uh, write down so if i will write fi is if i belongs to s and if i does not belong to s okay so let's take some value one side you have to take positive one side you have to take negative otherwise you won't get cancellation okay so if i take this constant here what will be the inner product with the constant vector it will be a times k and here it will be plus b times n minus k i want that to be zero right so it makes sense to take a to be minus of n minus k and b to be k so if i do that then i get zero right so i will get n mi minus of n minus k times k plus k times n minus k so this will be zero f is orthogonal to the constant vector okay uh, is this okay if i take a to be minus of n minus k what happens this is minus of n minus k into k and here it is plus k so it's k into n minus k so that will cancel f is orthogonal to the constant vector so let's calculate the norm squared of f what is the norm squared of f this value squared will come how many times k times k times and this value squared will come how many times n minus k times so if i pull out k into n minus k as a common factor here i am left with n minus k here and a k here that will add up to n so k into n minus k into n that is the l2 norm squared of f we also need to calculate the really quotient we need lf in a product f what is that any questions about the norm squared or the definition of f i chose it like this so that f is orthogonal to the constant vector 1 so now what is lf in a product f any ideas so do you remember what is lf in a product f in general is a sum over all h is i exactly. minus 5 minus 0 exactly it is sum over all edges of f5 minus fj square now if uh, there is an edge between two vertices here what's the difference of the values it is zero same value right any two edges here the value is same only when i have a value here and here for this the difference is going to be how much b minus a right b minus a or a minus b whatever so this will give me how much and b minus a is how much one side we have k other side we have minus of n minus k the difference is n so we will get n squared for each edge which is crossing s to s complement the difference of the function values on the two ends is n actually because one is negative n minus k the other is k the difference is n n now minus n i am anyway going to square it but how many edges are there how many edges are there maximum n into n minus k no we will write it as just e of s s complement right that's exactly the number of edges that is there you okay it is n squared because all edges within s will give me zero difference all edges within s complement will give me zero difference it's only edges going from s to s complement and that's precisely what is e s s complement number of edges with one end in s and other in s complement that's what i used in the that uh, one. okay so fine so now what do we get hence lf in a product f divided by norm f square will give me n square times e of s s complement divided by k times n minus k times n 
Okay, that is norm f square. Now let's write that as E of S S complement divided by what is K? K is the size of S, right? K is the size of S into one N cancels and I get N over N minus K. Now, how big is N over N minus K? So K, K is less than or equal to N by two. Okay, k is less than or equal to n minus two. So n over n minus k is at most two. Because n minus k is at least n by two. Therefore, this ratio is at most half. N minus k is more than half of n. So this is at most half. So you get two times the number of edges. So this is true. So what this tells us is, therefore, lambda two. Any such thing will be an upper bound for lambda two. You agreed, right? You take any f lambda two is with a, a perpendicular to one. Lambda two is less than or equal to this. So this is an f which is perpendicular to one. So lambda two is less than or equal to this, which is less than or equal to this. So two times e of s s complement over cardinality of s. For all s subsets of V with cardinality s less than equal to n by two. So if I take minimum over that, what do I get? Of this quantity, what do I get? What is this? Yeah, what is this minimum? H. Is, is H right? That is the definition of H. Okay, so I don't know if I lost you. Let me quickly repeat again. So lambda two can be bounded by for any f which is orthogonal to the constant vector. Lambda two is bounded by the LF in the product f by norm f square. So now what I'm doing is for every subset of s with cardinality less than or equal to n by two, I'm producing an f. Which is orthogonal to one, like this. Okay, if you don't see that it is orthogonal to one, check it later. Okay, it is orthogonal to one. Therefore, L F inner product F over norm F square D is an upper bound for lambda two. So I calculate L F inner product F over norm F square, and I find that that's exactly the same as the cardinality of the number of edges going from S to S complement divided by volume of S, number of elements in S. Times n over n minus k, but since k is less than or equal to n by two, this is at most two. Therefore, I get two times this. So I get two times h as the upper bound for lambda two, and that was Boser's inequality. Lambda two less than or equal to two h. So we have to Boser's inequality. Any questions here so far? Uh, did I lose you? I mean, do you want me to explain something, sir? Uh, the summation f i minus f j whole square equal to uh, this part yeah. equal to n square times this line. Now, when is f i minus f j not zero? I am taking this particular f for all i in s. It is this value for all i in s complement. It is this value. So if f i minus f j is to be not zero, what can you say about i and j? Uh, they have to be one of them is in s, another is in s complement. Okay, then in what not... is the then what is so, the difference? Okay, 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 yeah, yeah, n minus k. Yeah, so that difference will be n. So when you square it, you get n square. Difference will be n or minus n. The square will be n square. Yes, so, and e of this many times, times it comes. that comes. Exactly. So okay, sir. Okay. Sir. That's exactly how many exactly. That's the way it comes. Okay, so this is Bose's inequality, which tells you that lambda two is at most. Uh, so uh, this way, one inequality. The other inequality we have to prove. That's the that's more non-trivial. Chigas inequality. We'll uh, start that unless there are some questions before. I'll. Are there any questions?
So I may not do all the steps here, or I will try. So proof of Chigas inequality. <clears throat> Okay, so what do we have to prove? We have to prove, let's write down here. What we have to prove is that h square over 2 delta is less than or equal to lambda 2, where delta is the max degree. And this is what we have to prove. So the whole idea is like this, okay? So what is happening in this entire thing? The thing is like this. So this is how you imagine. So G is the graph. I'm just writing it as a blob, okay? So there are vertices here. Now, what about F1? F1, what kind of vector is it? Okay, so let's, let's to motivate the proof, let me, huh, so to motivate, so let's ask this way. So, F1 is the constant vector, right? One everywhere at all the vertices. Everywhere it is one. Oh, I mean, uh, you may want to normalize or not normalize. If I don't normalize, it's one. Otherwise, one by root. Now, what do you know about F2? F2 is orthogonal to F1. So it can't be positive everywhere, right? F2 should look how it should be positive in some parts and it should be negative in some parts. Maybe some vertices it has to be positive, some vertices it has to be negative. Otherwise, it cannot be orthogonal to this, right? Because what is F2 in a product F1? It is just the sum of elements of F2. So that has to be zero. That means there has to be both positive and negative. Is that okay? Okay. So in particular, let us think of a disconnected graph. Suppose G was like this, consisted of two parts, G1 and G2. Okay, so let's say M vertices here, or let's say, yeah, M vertices and M, let's say equal. It doesn't have to be equal, but in this case, what does F1 look like? F1 is again all one here. Let's take F2 be all one here. What is a possible choice for F2? In this case, lambda 2 is also 0, by the way. So there are many choices for F1 and F2. But I am saying, suppose I have choose F1 to be the all constant 1, how would you choose F2 in this particular case? Well, we can choose all 1. Here you choose all 1. Okay. Here? And minus 1. Here you choose minus 1. Because then, equal size, right? So then they will be orthogonal to each other. And anyway, you see that this also is an eigenvector because Fi minus Fj in a product, uh, sum of squares is zero here also because there are no edges between. So what this is suggesting is that one way of capturing the connected components is to take the second eigenvector and see where it is positive, where it is negative, right? So if you see, if you don't know the components a priori, and if you take this eigenvector, this component is where it is one, and this component is where it is minus one. So the idea is that. So we basically want to take the second eigenvector and use that to break the uh, graph into two parts in such a way that the expansion is high. So we, what do we want? We want an, uh, here we want a, uh, we want a high expansion. We want to show that, yeah, uh, sorry, what did, sorry, what did I do? Uh, no, 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 I did something, did I do? Uh, what am I saying? Yeah, lambda two is greater than equal to, yeah, we want, uh, uh, we want to produce a set with high expansion, yeah, right? Ha ha, sorry. Yeah, so what do we, we want an upper bound for H. What does that mean? What does it mean to get upper bound for H? H is a minimum of things. That means you have to produce one S. 
Okay, we have to produce this. So we need to produce. one s subset of v with cardinality less than equal to n by 2 such that the ratio of the number of edges going out to the size of the set is smaller than how much square root 2 delta lambda 2 okay you want to say h is smaller than square root 2 delta lambda 2 that means there is some set as such that this is smaller because this is minimum. It's not that all sets have to be small. There is just produce one such set so that this is small. Now, what the, how do you produce one such set? That is where this picture comes into play. The hint is use the, the picture suggest idea is use F2 to produce such an S. Okay, so that is the overarching idea of the proof. Now I can uh, go into more details, uh, but any questions at the intuitive level? So you have to produce one set with a small expansion and where will I, how will I produce that set? My suggestion is we will use the second eigenvector and produce that set. Okay, how will we use that? Uh, how will we use the second eigenvector is a point which we'll come to, okay? Okay, any uh, questions in general about this? If not, let's proceed. Let's proceed. Let's see uh, what we get. Okay, so more precisely, so let F2 be the second eigenvector. So that is LF2 is equal to lambda 2, okay? So what we will do is for convenience, basically the set that we will produce will be all those vertices with, it will be what is called a sub-level set of F2. What I mean by this is you fix some value of value, some number, and you take all those vertices where F2 takes value less than that number, okay? We have to choose that number appropriately. So rather more conveniently, let me do this. Without loss of generality, arrange the vertices, relabel the vertices so that. But sir, here it should be LF2 is equals to lambda 2 F2. Ah, yeah, thank you. So LF2 is lambda 2 F2. So F2 is something, right? So let's write F2 of one is the value at one. So I want it so that F2 of, uh, maybe rather than write F2 and uh, F, let's just write F, okay? So that makes it simpler. So, okay, so I will not write F2, I will just write F, just to make it simpler for myself. So without loss of uh, generality, I arrange the vertices so that the coordinates are like this, F1 greater than equal to F2 greater than equal to now don't get confused with F1, F2 as above. The, here I mean F of one, the value of this vector at the vertex one, greater than equal to value of the vertex two and so on up to Fn. Is this okay or is it confusing? Do you understand what I mean by this? You just arrange the vertices, F is a vector, right? F is the second eigenvector. You arrange the core, you relabel the coordinates so that the values of F are decreasing weekly. That I can do. I can just name the vertices differently. Nobody stops me from doing that. Now, let k be n by 2. Okay, we n by 2 may not be an integer, so take the flow or ceiling of it. Uh, okay, so let's fix this. And so this proof is, by the way, somewhat non-trivial. You may not get all the things immediately. So it's not that, how, how am I going to do? So we have to define two vectors, G and H, okay? So G is defined like this. Six 
excuse me sir yes uh so my one question is that f1 is greater than equal to f2 and so on up to fn or norm of f1 is greater than equal to norm no 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 in uh, not not norm not absolute value i mean the values they are real numbers right okay so see f1 is not eigen vector okay right. so right right yep. okay f is okay whatever i got earlier forget that f1 f2 fn this is what i mean that's why i don't write f2 i don't want to double subscript what i mean is f is this one don't think of f1 is not a vector so the second eigen vector i am writing like this okay sir is that yes, okay the function values of vertices sir Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want, if it is more, I thought that might be more confusing. So I didn't write like this. I could have written f of one greater than equal to f of two greater than equal to. Right, sir. This is what I mean. Okay? Yes. Not sir. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe that is better. But just writing subscript is easier. So I kind of switched notation. So if it causes confusion, so. Define a new vector g, which is f i minus f k for i less than equal to k and zero for i bigger than k. K is n by two, and h i is zero for i less than equal to k, and it is f k minus f i for i bigger than k. Okay, so these are two vectors. Somehow we are breaking the vector into positive parts and negative parts. in some sense g g and h are both positive vectors so we are dividing into two parts g and h okay so the main claim is that the claim is going to be here i write down a claim that lf in a product f is greater than or equal to lg in a product g plus lh in a product h okay so this is the uh, this is a claim okay i probably will not have time to prove this claim or let us see maybe in the tutorials or something so let's leave this claim for the moment how am i going to work with that so what is obvious is i will not write that as claim that norm f squared uh yeah so the no uh, no 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 hold on yeah what will be norm f squared will be is it true that it is less than equal to norm g square plus norm x square i'm trying to think so f i minus f k squared if we sum so this right side is summation f i minus f k triangle inequality yes sir yeah so we are taking this one the thing is it is you may know this fact so where is this coming from okay this is coming from the following thing if i give you any numbers x1 up to xn then you may have seen this in statistics class or somewhere if you take the sum of xi minus c square what is the c which minimizes this you know which c minimizes the sum of squares to if you want to find a c such that the distance to all the xi sum of squares is minimized what is that number so the mean the mean okay so this if you don't know it just do it it's a matter of minimizing the quadratic it's a quadratic expression in c you can do that so the mean is what minimizes that x bar where x bar is x1 plus x2 xn by n now the point is summation fi minus fk square k is fixed 
when I sum over this is greater than or equal to because of okay. this fi, what is the mean of f? f bar, which is one over n summation fi is how much is that? It is zero because f is orthogonal to the constant vector. This is f in our product one. Summation fi is f in our product one. So this is zero. So this is greater than or equal to summation fi. Okay. So that's why this is this is true. Is this okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So now that we have it, so therefore, if you take LF in a product F divided by norm F square, on the one hand, this is equal to lambda 2, right? F is the second eigenvector. So the Rayleigh quotient is going to give me lambda 2. On the other hand, because of these two inequalities, so this is because F is a second eigenvector. Okay, here I am not using all this. But now I will use the claim. L, the numerator is greater than or equal to LG inner product G plus LH inner product H and divide by norm G square plus norm H square. Because the numerator is greater than, the denominator is smaller than or equal to, so we get this. Now, whenever you have something like A plus B over C plus D, this is greater than or equal to A over C min B over D. It's, this is an easy thing to check. So this is greater than or equal to the minimum of these two things. This is an elementary inequality that if you have A plus B divided by C plus D, that is greater than or equal to minimum of A by C and B by D. Okay? So, the point is that F achieved the uh, second eigenvalue, the F quotient, but one of G and H will be what we will use and that will, one of them will have really quotient smaller than lambda 2. That is important. Okay. So without loss of generality, we can take that this is the smaller one. Okay. Otherwise, you give a similar argument for H. So is there a question? Is there a question? Uh, there is a bit of noise. People who are unmuted can mute themselves, except when asking questions, of course. So, the point is, F, the Rayleigh quotient is lambda 2, and we are saying one of these two will have Rayleigh quotient smaller. Let's say that is G. Okay, what is G, what is H? They are similar things. You can carry out a similar argument for H. So, let's assume this thing. So, we get lambda 2 is less than, is beats LG in a product G. Okay. Uh, yeah, so sorry, where did I erase that? So this is the smaller. Okay, now we have to analyze LG in our product B over norm G square. What we are going to do is the following. Okay, LG in our product G over norm G square. There is a little bit of a non triviality here. We will write this as LG in a product G. First of all, that is, you uh, okay. First, let me write this LG in a product G over norm G square, and I will multiply and divide by some quantity, which is uh, okay. So, anyways, let's write this one. So, let's write this. What is what this is? Okay, what is this? LG in a product G is sum over all edges of g i minus g j square and norm g square is sum over all vertices of g i square. Okay. What I am going to multiply is by this strange quantity. Why I should do this, I cannot motivate, but let us do it anyway. g i plus g j square. And divide by the same thing. I can do that. 
I am just multiplying and divide. I mean, I am just multiplying by one. So I can do this. The thing is, the numerator is becomes nicer. So the thing about it is, the numerator is what happens to the numerator. Uh, yeah, what am what am I doing? Uh, yeah, the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. Okay, so we will use two inequalities here. So first of all, by Cauchy Schwarz inequality, the numerator. Is greater than equal to see summation a i square into summation b i square is greater than equal to summation a i b i. It's eleven o'clock. Ah, okay. I am already out of time. Okay. So let me just write this one line. So by Cauchy-Schwarz. So this is Cauchy-Schwarz. Okay, that is okay, right? The product is g i minus g j into g i plus g j uh, will give me g i square minus g j square, and then I am squaring the whole thing. In the denominator, the thing is this quantity is basically is at least it is at most. Sorry, it is at most two times g i square plus g j square. All all at all edges, because a plus b whole square is at most two times a square plus b square. But what that will give me is sum of g i square times two delta is less than equal to because each i will come how many times as many times as it is in edges, and the number of times it comes is at most delta. So the whole thing is greater than equal to two delta, and then this becomes norm g square. And I already had a norm g square, so that will give me norm g raised to the power four. Okay, so now I it will take me another ten fifteen minutes to complete the proof. Maybe I will take a little bit of time in the tutorial to complete the proof. Okay, so already I am out of time, so it takes a bit more manipulation to prove it. I will probably skip the claim, but anyway I will post uh, maybe uh, give you a link to the proof. Okay, so sorry about this. I I'll probably take a little time in the tutorial to finish. This.